Good morning, Bearcats. Good to see you all this morning. Looking good out there. Hey, some folks are still trying to get in, so uh, make sure you open some seats beside you. So as you come into chapel, make sure that you scan in, make sure that you scan out, make sure that you get your attendance in chapel. Also, big day for SBU Bearcats. Lots of exciting things happening. One of the things that we want to track this semester is Bearcat Serve Air Hours. Bearcats serve hours. There's going to be lots of opportunities for you to serve on campus, serve in our community, serve in your church, and we want you to track those hours so that we can say this is how many hours that Bearcats serve throughout this semester or throughout the year. There's going to be a, a QR code throughout campus. Scan that QR code. Every time you do some service hours, just log it. It's not for a grade. It's not for anything related to your academics. It's just an opportunity for us to say this is what Bearcats are doing in our community and things that we're doing. Related to service, there's a servant leadership fair on Thursday at 7 o'clock. How many know about the leadership, uh, servant leadership fair? Opportunities to get plugged into service areas, churches, those kind of things. So when is it? Thursday. At what time? 7 p.m. Anyone know where it's located? On the forum. Ex excellent, excellent. All right, you guys know all about it. There's also an opportunity for you, if you are part of or interested in Dangerous Men and Unveil, there's a free Freedom Club from a clean slate. These are a great opportunities for you to get plugged in next Monday, next Monday at 7 p.m. in the Davis Theater, there'll be an informational meeting. So opportunity for clean slate, opportunity for new beginnings for the Freedom Club. Encourage you to participate in that. Today there's a big thing happening. How many of you have blood pumping through your veins right now? All right, that's about half of you. So uh, I'm concerned about the other half. Uh, today, who knows what's happening on campus? Blood drive, that's exactly right. Over in McClellan Dining Hall from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Now, McClellan Dining Hall is McClellan Conference Center. You guys know where that is, right? So don't go to the marketplace to get blood. Go over to McClellan, and there's an opportunity, 12 to 6 today, opportunity to donate. You'll get a free T-shirt, two admissions to Dickerson Park Zoo uh, while supplies last. So go over there and give to give life. All right, this Friday, there's a career fair. Listen up, listen up, this is important. How many of you want a job when you graduate? All right, again, about half of you. I'm concerned about the other half in this room. Some of you want a job. For those of you who do want a job, a career fair is a great opportunity for you to start meeting people in your field. It's an opportunity to get internships. It's an opportunity to connect with businesses and, and industry and folks, those kind of things. This Friday in the student union from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. is a career fair. So just check it out. Go meet people. Be ready to uh, sign up for opportunities. Get plugged in. I think it's some awesome opportunities. Also, this Friday on, uh, on let's see, sorry, Student game night. Oh, that's right. Student game night. How many of you ever participated in student game night? All right. Three of you. What do you do at student game night? Play games. Awesome. Okay. If you want to play games, this Friday in the student union from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. is going to be an op opportunity for student game night. So come on out. Going to be a lot of opportunities. Now, last week we had a question of the week. Who remembers what the question of the week was? Theme for what? Athletic events. So hopefully you participated in that question of the week. One of the things, listen up, one of the things Student Association wants from you is your advice, your counsel, your insights. So they're going to ask a question every week to give some insight, which means you have a voice and a vote in things that happen. All right? So find the QR code, scan the QR code, answer the question. This is this week's question. This is really an important question. What makes you hesitant to participate in a CGC mission trip? What makes you hesitant to participate in a CGC mission trip? This is really going to help us identify what are the things that maybe are roadblocks or hurdles for you that we could help remove. So answer that question this week. If you do that, there's going to be opportunity for a $10 gift card uh, for those who respond. So just check out the TVs, find out the Q QR code, and go from there tonight. Uh, we have a lot of international students here. In fact, I think we have 75 or 80 international students, literally from all over the world. So uh, I'm just curious, if you're an international student, would you stand up? If you're an international student? All right. Give it up for our international students.
We love our international students. We're so grateful that we're here. We want to represent our international students well. When you go out into the forum here and you walk out, you see all of those flags. That represents our students uh, from all around the world, and we want to continue to celebrate them. Tonight at the President's House, listen up, if you're an international student, we're hosting you for dinner tonight with Chick-fil-A. Now, if you're not an international student, you cannot sign up for this event, even though it's Chick-fil-A. But if you are an international student and you haven't signed up yet, please see Stedman. We still have a few openings there for tonight, but we're really excited to host you. Also, this coming Monday, there's an opportunity for FCA kickoff. So how many of you have been involved in FCA? All right, a handful of you, quite a few. I see quite a few hands there. Monday night at 7.30 p.m. in the football field, there's going to be a big FC kickoff. So really encourage you to do that. Also, does anyone know what's happening on Saturday on this campus at noon? Football. That's exactly right. Right. What's that? Did I miss something? Okay. Football at noon. Right before that at 10.30, who knows what's happening? Tailgate. That's exactly right. Come on out for the tailgate. It's going to be an opportunity. Listen, it's purple. Purple out. Wear purple. What am I wearing? Purple. Why do we wear purple? Because it's our colors and we have team spirit and team pride. So come on out. Wear some purple. Make it happen. Hey, over this weekend, a few things happened. Maybe you followed some of those. Women's cross country took second at the Bear Kite Invite. Men took fourth. Give it up for our men's and women's track cross country. Football dominated on the field, winning 65 to 7. Give it up for men's football. Logan Turner won the fourth GLVC Player of the Week as a junior. Give it up for Logan. I say fourth as in that's his fourth time of winning GLVC Player of the Week. Incredible job. In fact, I think every single one of his field goals was over 50 yards. Isn't that right? Something like that. 40, over 40 yards. All right, incredible, impressive. All right, Logan Turner, we give it up. Uh, SBU football again, football game this coming Saturday. Be there. It's going to be a great game. We have lots of things happening, which I'm super excited about. Now, listen, I have a question for you. How many of you love traditions? All right, three of you. What about things like Thanksgiving and Christmas or maybe cookouts and Maybe kinds of things like going out to fireworks. Yeah. All right. What about Welcome Week? Bagpipes. What about the Bearcat Barnyard Bash? Yeah. How about the Mud Tug? Yeah. What about Spirit Chapel? Yeah. All right. What about late night breakfast? Come on now. All right. Some of you might like fall break and spring break. Anybody with me? Yeah. All right. Mission trips with CGE. And none of you have quite experienced this yet. Maybe a few of you have. Commencement. That's where you actually walk across the stage and you get to shake my hand and I hand you a diploma. That's a big tradition, right? That's a milestone. That's a marker. All those things we just mentioned, all of those milestones, all of those traditions are really important to your SBU experience. And we just want to encourage you, take opportunities to participate in them, join them. One of the traditions, and this is the last thing, one of the traditions that we do here at SBU is our SBU fight song. Our SBU Bearcat fight song. And we want to teach every single person in this room the fight song. And to do that, would you please join in welcoming to the stage Athletic Director Clark Sheehy. All right. Give it up. Give it up. All right. Good morning, Bearcats. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, uh, so here's what happens after every win that we have. We sing the fight song. If we could put the words up there, I'm going to talk you through it, and then we're going to go through it. It's, 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 uh, we're all going to be able to get this. First line says, stand up and cheer our fighting Bearcats. Stand up and cheer and clap your hands. Stand up and cheer our fighting Bearcats. Stand up and cheer and rock the stands. Stand up and cheer. Are you getting a theme here? Stand up and cheer our fighting Bearcats. No matter where, no matter when because we support our fighting Bearcats. So come on, Bearcats, go fight, win. And then we say, Bearcats, Bearcats, go fight, win. Now at the end, we add, there, there, yes, yes, there, thank you. We added something last year that's been a great addition. 
is you, is you kind of roll your hands. I, I don't want to mess up my mic. And then at the end, you say, roll cats. Now, at the end, when you say cats, you can go paw here, or you can go fist for strength, whichever way. We'll let, we'll let you have some artistic interpretation with that, okay? So we're going to sing this. I need some, my friends, friends, come on out here and help us sing the fight song. Come on. All right. Now, all right. All right. Now, now let's, if you notice, the first line say, stand up, all right? All right. Here we go. Stand up and cheer our fighting bear cat. Stand up and cheer and clap. Stand up and cheer our fighting bear cat. Stand up and cheer and clap the stand. Stand up and cheer our fighting bear cat. No matter where, no matter when. Because we support our fighting bear cat. So come on, bear cat. Go fight with bear cat. Bear cat. Go fight with roll. We've got one more guest that wanted to join us, Dr. Melson. All right, you, might got, you guys might want to stand up for our special guest. Let's go. the Bearcat. Can we do it one more time? Stand up and cheer our fighting Bearcats. Stand up and Great job. Woo! All right, Bearcat. All right, Bearcat. Give it up for Bearcat. All right, give it up for all of our cheerleaders, all the athletes who joined us out here to sing. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Awesome, awesome Bearcat fight song. We're super excited about our new Bearcat. We had to wait through the summer. He had to come all the way through customs, all the way from Southeast Asia, and we are so excited that he's here. So welcome, Bearcat. Every time you see Bearcat, go out, give him a big high five, cheer on with him, sing the fight song. Now, there's only one challenge. Bearcat does not have a name. Bearcat does not have a name. Some of us call him what? BC, BC. So as early as the 1900s, we have some traditions around here. As early as the 1900s, early 1900s, we had some athletes named Bearcats. And along the way, we continue to uh, have Bearcats in lots of different ways. And today we get to welcome our new mascot, Bearcat. But we think Bearcat needs a name. Now maybe you think B BC is the name for Bearcat and you wanna submit that as a nomination. So listen. You, as students, can submit nominations for the new Bearcat name to communications at sbuniv.edu, communications at sbuniv.edu. The top three nominations will be voted on during the week of September 25th, which leads up to homecoming. So homecoming, 
is we're going to reveal the name for Bearcat. All right? How many of you have a good name? All right. A handful of you. All right. Be thinking about it. Be thinking of a good name for Bearcat. Submit your nominations. Top three will vote on, which means this group of classes right here, you determine the history and the future for Bearcat for the future. So choose wisely. <laughs> All right. Now, you may decide BC is Bearcat's name. Just submit BC. You might have another name for Bearcat. Just submit it. Communications at sbu.niv.edu. All right. Is everyone ready? All right. Really stoked that you're here. Really excited about what's happening at SBU. One of the things we want to focus on each week is a fighter verse. A fighter verse is a verse that we can call upon in time of need. It encourages us. And this week's fighter verse should be on the screen here. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 6. I just want us to read it out loud together. So join me in reading it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We want you to be satisfied, satisfied in Christ alone, our greatest treasure of all things. These verses that we recite each week and look at each week, they're opportunities for us as a body of Christ together, that in time of need, opportunities for us to mourn with one another, to celebrate together, to do things in, in community together. All of these opportunities are reminders for us from God's word. And it's a great opportunity as a fighter verse to fight along for the faith in Jesus Christ. Today we have Dr. Dan DeWitt who's going to be joining us to speak. Dr. DeWitt is our, our director for the Center for Worldview and Cultural Analysis. And uh, there's lots of opportunities to connect with him. In fact, he's going to show you on the screen throughout this presentation today lots of things happening this semester that you're going to hear from some special guests coming from outside of our community to come and speak to us and lots of exciting things. So let me pray for us and then we're gonna welcome Dr. DeWitt. So Father, this morning we come before you to celebrate our wonderful traditions here at SBU. We are unapologetically a Christ-centered university. It unites us in who we are and we celebrate together in all of our traditions and all of our history and our heritage. And we have a team spirit. We have a unity around our Bearcat theme song and our Bearcat experience and our Bearcats. And God, we want to use these opportunities to glorify you through the things that we do in the SBU experience. So we praise you, we exalt you, and we look forward to these words that we hear from Dr. DeWitt today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel DeWitt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, when I say, how's it going, you say, it's all good. How's it going? It's all good. So it's great to be with you, and uh, I have a few things I wanted to share by way of announcement, and instead of just sharing them, I thought I'd put it in a video. So turn your attention to the screens. Here's some of the things that are going on with the Worldview Center this school year. <laughs>
All right, so that's what's going on this year. We'd love to have you be a part of it. And other, a bunch of other stuff we're going to do, but that's just kind of a highlight. Um, what I want to do today, it's kind of a, a exciting, um, not start to the school year, but a lot of exciting things going on. And what I thought I would do today that might be helpful is just to, to teach a prayer out of Scripture and then to pray this prayer over you. And so if you have your Bibles, take them out and turn to Colossians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul wrote this short letter <clears throat> to young believers who were living in a very secular context where people thought they were crazy for what they believed. So it's a short letter written to young believers to encourage them in their faith as they lived in a culture where people literally thought they were crazy, insane for what they believed. As you could tell, this is relevant for us in all kinds of ways, first and foremost, because it's God's breathed out word, his inspired word for us. But these are indicative of the times that we live in ourselves. So let me just read the first few verses and then unpack this prayer and then I'm going to close by praying this for you. Paul tells them, I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you. Now I need to insert a little commentary here because I've interpreted this as a prayer. The reason I'm interpreting Paul's struggle as a prayer is really for a few reasons. First of all, um, the apostle Paul tells them he's not seen them. He's not, they're working in their midst and so Paul is struggling for people he's not yet met. So I think this is not describing a physical struggle, but rather a spiritual one. And the second reason is that fits into a theme in the Apostle Paul's writings. He writes in Ephesians that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. A third reason I'm interpreting this as a prayer is in Colossians 4, in this same book, and a, a, a key to reading your Bible and interpreting it is if something doesn't really make sense, see what the author says about that same topic in that book, and then expand it out to other things they've written, and then expand it out to that testament, and then expand it out to the whole Bible. Well, we don't have to go far to find Paul talking about struggle. In Colossians chapter 4, in this book, Paul uses this expression to describe prayer. And so Paul tells them that he's having a great struggle for them, and I really think this is talking about a prayer. So here Paul tells them that he is, I'm arguing that he's struggling for them in prayer. He goes on to say, for those at Laodicea and for all who've not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Like a good Baptist sermon, Paul's prayer has three points. And so I want to give you kind of the three chief points of Paul's prayer. But first, let me say this. Paul is like the greatest intellect, the greatest mind in the history of the Christian church. I mean, obviously, the mind of Christ we all have and we're all to emulate. But in terms of Christian people, humans, um, Paul was an amazing intellect. I mean, he was trained in philosophy. He was trained in theology. He knew the Old Testament better than his, his contemporaries. He was this amazing guy. And then after his conversion, he was the greatest church planner and greatest missionary, um, martyr for the faith. He's an amazing, godly, smart man. And he tells them he's struggling for them in prayer. If, if Paul wrote me a letter, Paul, this Paul wrote me a letter and said, I am struggling for you in prayer, I would think, man, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be like dripping with like profound theology. And the very first point of his prayer I would have found if I were them, perhaps maybe a little discouraging or surprising at the least. Paul, this great intellect, says, I'm praying for you. I'm struggling for you. I'm wrestling for you. And the very first thing he's praying is that they would be encouraged. That seems so simple and obvious. It almost feels like it's just a Hallmark card. Like, Paul, you're this great intellect, and you're wrestling for us in prayer, and your prayer is that we would be encouraged. But the reality is this. When we are discouraged, we are prone to make stupid decisions. How many of you have ever made a stupid decision because you were discouraged? Okay, and how many of you are lying right now? Just right now. We've all done that. I mean, you can think back to maybe a time in your life where you were uncertain of what was going on. You were a little paranoid. Maybe people were mean to you. Even Christian people were mean to you. And you were just kind of, you felt like the world was against you. 
Were you brilliant during that season or were you prone to make bad decisions? The reality is when we're discouraged, we are often impulsive. And Paul's praying that they would first and foremost be encouraged, that their hearts would be encouraged. A friend of mine, a uh, partner in ministry who I've done some ministry with in the past, had the wonderful privilege of becoming um, close friends with a world-famous atheist, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, You may have heard of Christopher Hitchens. He died a few years ago um, of esophageal cancer. Before Christopher died, Larry was able to uh, travel with Christopher Hitchens. They debated each other, and he organized some debates where they were together, um, and they even did a Bible study together through the first opening verses of John's gospel. After Christopher died, people who knew of their friendship wanted Larry to speak about their friendship. In fact, he published a book um, called The Faith of the faith of Christopher Hitchens, the soul of the world's most notorious atheist. And so he traveled all over the place speaking about their relationship. And what he would always do is after he was done speaking, he would go and spend time with the atheist student organizations on those campuses. And he would ask them a series of questions. He would buy them a meal. And after he did that for several months, he wrote an article for The Atlantic, and he talked about his experience and his observations about young atheists. In fact, the title of his article was something like, Lessons Christians Can Learn from Young Atheists. One of his observations was that every one of them, at least the people he talked to, had some religious experience in the past. Somewhere in their background, they had been to church. They had a mom or a grandma who took them to church. That was one observation. Another observation is that they felt like when they asked serious questions at their church, they were given superficial answers. Kind of like people would just pat them on the head and say, well, that's cute. You know, pray your Bible or pray more, read your Bible more, that kind of thing. Um, However, when they had an adult who took their questions seriously, even if they didn't have the answers, they had great respect for them. One of his final observations in this really um, article that went viral, one of his final observations was that almost every one of them described their trajectory away from faith in God and belief in Jesus in emotional categories. They've been deeply burned in a religious context and they rejected Christianity not so much because they were intellectually convinced it wasn't true, but rather because they were deeply hurt and wounded and let down by religious leaders. With that as a context or a backdrop rather to Paul's prayer, his words seem all the more profound. When we are discouraged, we are prone to make really bad decisions. And some of those decisions have to do with our beliefs, what we believe about God. And if we're not careful, we'll let our experience drive us to intellectual commitments that we otherwise wouldn't even consider. I closed out my summer by spending the last full week of August in a maximum security prison in Texas. I taught 38 men who will never have the opportunity to be released from prison on an introduction to philosophy. It was an amazing experience, and several of the men in my class were believers. And every one of them who was a follower of Jesus would recount to me stories of how they at times doubted what they believed and how their beliefs ended up having consequences. All beliefs have consequences, and as John Stone Street, who's a Christian author, likes to say, Ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. The one thing I found to be true is this. I I found men in that prison, and then in other contexts, and secular contexts as well, who were flourishing in their faith. And I've seen students in environments like this who walk away from faith in God, which that tells me that spiritual flourishing can happen anywhere. An apostasy, which means walking away from faith, can happen anywhere as well. Where does it begin? I would say it begins in one's heart. Paul prays that their hearts would be encouraged. The second thing he prays for them is that their hearts would be knit together in love. I've described this point as Paul's prayed that they would be encouraged, and then second, that they would be in community. When you are discouraged and isolated, you are highly vulnerable. When you are discouraged and isolated, you are highly vulnerable to attacks from without, attacks of the evil one, Satan, and also attacks from within. 
We could be our own worst enemy, and when we go further and further into ourselves, it becomes just a ever-spiraling um, path that leads to emptiness and doubt. I remember a young man who I was dean of a college in Kentucky, and a young man came for his first year. He transferred from the University of Louisville. He took one class. He showed up for a Monday night class, a three-hour lecture. I was not the professor, um, but I knew this young man, and I spent some time with him because he was in the same Sunday school class that my wife and I attended at church. He came to his one class the first night of the semester, and then he went home to his apartment and took his own life. He was desperately looking for answers. He was desperately looking for relationships. And if you don't think that all of us were second-guessing what could we have done differently, we did. And we lived under the weight of that. Paul prays that they would be encouraged and also that they would be in community. God has created you not to live a life of following Jesus by yourself, but in community with others. Because not only do you need them, but they need you. You might think, look, I really don't want to go to church because it doesn't have that much for me. But what about the people there who need you? The church will never be entirely what it could be without your presence. God has uniquely gifted you to serve and to encourage someone else. You need community and community needs you. And so you might selfishly think, I don't want to bother my other people with my problems. But what about the people that need you? Paul prays that their hearts would be encouraged and also that their hearts would be knit together in love. I was preaching on this text in Boston, Massachusetts for a friend of mine who um, accidentally planted a church there several years ago. He just loves Jesus. He wasn't there to plant a church, but he, he shared the gospel with every family that lives on his street at some point, and they had all come to faith in Jesus except for one household. And that household still hasn't given out yet. They're, they still don't believe. But everybody else on the street, I've walked up and down the street with my friend Sean, and he'll tell me about the families and who lives there and when he shared the gospel with them. And um, one of his neighbors attempted to take their own life. And Sean was there with some of the other people on their street who cared for them and knew them. And while they were standing in the hospital room, one of his neighbors said, why don't you start a Bible study? We need to be taught the Bible. We need community. And that led to him starting a church. And uh, when I preached there about six years ago, they were running 3,000 on that Sunday. Um, They, every year, send out hundreds of people to start new churches. They're now the fastest growing church in New England. And on the Sunday I was there, I was sharing from this passage. And I said, you know, um, and by the way, the people who come to his church, most of them don't have a church background. They survey their church people pretty regularly, and um, about 50% of them became Christians at that church, which is pretty uncommon. And then there's about another 25% who became a Christian somewhere else, but they moved to Boston. And then there's another 25% who will say, I'm not a Christian at all. I'm just here because someone invited me. And so the people in his church don't know how you're supposed to act in church just yet. I kind of hope they never learn, right? Right? And so I shared that verse that Paul prayed that their hearts will be knit together in love. And I said, you know, this is kind of anachronistic, which means it's kind of out of time, meaning that we don't see people knitting, at least I don't. I don't see people knitting like I used to when I was a little boy. And I, you, it seemed more common back then to be at the store or be at the hospital or in a waiting room or something and people to be sitting there knitting. And there was a lady who just couldn't help herself. And she didn't know you're not supposed to like just blurt out and talk back to the preacher. She goes, oh, I'm knitting. I'm like, that's great. What are you knitting? And so she held it up. I said, can you stand up? And I forgot what she was making. But can you stand up and hold that up for everybody to to see it? So she held it up. And I said, that's what the apostle Paul says our church should look like. That our lives are so interwoven and interconnected that we make a cohesive whole. That if one part of it is missing, it's clearly missing, it's obviously missing, and the whole is weakened because a part is missing. Paul prayed that they would be encouraged and that they would be in community. And I have to say this because I know it's true of every Christian university I've ever spoken at, um, but it could be difficult to make it to church with all your other commitments. You may think that it's not important or necessary, but I would just tell you this. Pretty much all of the New Testament 
is instruction for churches, except for the Gospels and the book of Acts, right? And so once you get past Acts, it's just letters to churches. That's how much the church matters to God. It matters because he created you to live in community, and not only do you need them, as I've already said, they need you. So would you quit being so selfish and stingy with you and go be a part of a community where you could know other people and love and serve other people? That's what we were made for. When we're discouraged and we're isolated, we're extremely vulnerable, and some of you are there right now. And I just want you to know, if you're in that place, I would love to talk to you. Stedman would love to talk to you. Your faculty members would love to talk to you. Your president would love to talk to you because we don't want anyone in that place of despair and lack of hope because God has made us for the kinds of relationships where we encourage each other on. And what God does when we go through life together is he just starts to knit our hearts together. The third thing Paul prays for them is, I've worded it this way, that they would never get over the gospel. Paul says, I want your hearts to be encouraged. I want them to be knit together in love. And then he goes on to say, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's a single word that summarizes the entire story of the Bible, and it's the word gospel. So what can be summarized in a single word, I'd like to unpack in six words, because that's what academics do. (laughs) It's been said that a teacher takes something complex and makes it simple. An educator takes something simple and makes it complex. And so let me take that one word gospel and just unpack it a little bit more. In six words that I believe summarize the storyline of the Bible. Here they are. God loves Sin separates, and then Jesus, I guess I need another finger, saves. Six words that can change your life. God loves. The Bible says that God created you for a purpose with a design, and you will not find flourishing running away from that design. You were created for a relationship with God, and yet, as Pascal, my favorite philosopher, said, our our chief problem is distraction. We distract ourselves from the God-sized hole in our hearts that nothing else can satisfy. And so what we do instead of paying attention to that emptiness that nothing else can fill is we seek to distract ourselves. We are amusing ourselves, as one writer wrote, we are amusing ourselves to death. God created you for a reason, and as Augustine The church father said, our hearts will be restless until they find their rest in him. And some of you have heard this so many times that it just becomes background noise. And sometimes we doubt the sincerity of a statement like that because we know what it feels like as Christians to still be unsatisfied. What God's calling us all to, Christians and people who don't know Jesus yet, is to find satisfaction in him. Standing in the the common space at the prison Um, For the college where I was teaching, they had a library lined from floor to ceiling filled with books that had been donated by different Christian philanthropists. About 300 men stood in the room that day. This particular program, forgive me for sharing these recent examples, but being in the prison impacted me, and I, I, I hope it doesn't rub off anytime soon. Maybe it could rub off a little bit on you in terms of the passion that these guys shared with me. There are 22 prisons in Texas that participate in this program. Men apply to it, and if they're accepted, they are transferred from one maximum security prison to this maximum security prison where I was teaching. They can't require that they be Christians because there's a state regulatory part of their program, but nonetheless, most of them are Christians. And standing in a room with about 300 men in various stages of their college experience. It's an accredited program. They'll graduate with a college degree. And when they graduate, they are transferred to a new prison, another maximum security prison. It doesn't shorten their sentences. They're not getting out any sooner because of their service. They want to make a difference in a place that they'll probably never get out of. So when they graduate, they'll go to another prison where they'll serve as a field minister, ministering to the fellow inmates. 
standing in a room with 300 men, most of whom know and love Jesus and have come to the point in their lives where they realize he is all they need because they're in a place where he is all they have. No longer able to distract themselves from the deepest needs of their soul, they have found in this dark place a joy that's unquestionable. And to be in their presence is to be humbled and to be convicted. I have one student who was helping me throughout my entire time there. And uh, he was sharing with me some of the challenges they deal with. People, um, if you're not aggressive and assertive, sometimes people will take advantage of you. And that puts some of the Christian inmates at a disadvantage because they refuse to retaliate. And he was telling me some of the things that happened to them as a result of that. And I said, how do you keep from saying something? Like, how, how do you keep from just not lashing out? And he looked at me and he said, I have come too far in my walk with Jesus to give it all up for some guy who wants to steal my stuff. God created you for a relationship where he shows you, as David says, in his presence there's fullness of joy. And his, at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. God loves, sin separates we have limited time, and also this is, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all know that that purpose for which we are created, we have been severed from it. And as C.S. Lewis once said, all of human history is the sad, as man's search for something other than God that will make him happy. Sin separates, but the beautiful thing of the gospel is this, God loves, sin separates, Jesus saves Paul prays that they would be encouraged, that their hearts would be knit together in love, and that they would never, ever get over the gospel. I want to conclude by reading the, the following verses and just making a couple comments, and I'm going to pray this prayer for you. Look at verse 4. Paul gives them a thesis statement. If you don't know what a thesis statement is, you probably need to take a writing class, right? I'll say it this way. If you don't know what a thesis statement is, you're, you're fixing to learn. Um, so a thesis statement is summarizing the purpose of the letter. In this case, Paul gives us a thesis statement, I think in part for the whole letter to the church in Colossae, but also his prayer. Paul tells them, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Paul writing this short letter to young believers in a secular context, he doesn't end it with despair, but rather he rejoices that they have a grounded and well-ordered faith. Paul says, I'm praying that you would be encouraged and in community and never get over the gospel so that no one can lead you away with plausible arguments. Your translation may say persuasive or compelling or well-reasoned arguments. Here Paul's not saying there's some people who aren't Christians and they're all stupid. That's not what he's saying at all. Paul's not saying that it's so obvious that Christianity is true, you will never be tempted by anything else. Rather, he's saying there are plausible, compe compelling, well-reasoned arguments. And if you're not careful, they will delude your faith. The greatest apologetic to that happening is not some book written by an academic like me. And I teach apologetics, I write books on apologetics, but Paul doesn't say, go read some books on apologetics. The greatest defense against plausible arguments, wait for this, is to be a part of a gospel-centered faith community that is filled with joy. The greatest defense to plausible arguments is to be a part of a gospel-centered faith community that's filled with joy. That's exactly what Paul's praying for, that they would be encouraged, that their hearts would be knit together in love, and that they would never get over God's mystery, which is Christ. I think maybe in the last 10 years, I forget what year it was published, there's a really smart atheist whose name was Lawrence Krauss. Um, he's a theoretical physicist. And Lawrence Krauss wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing. And I, I read it because I was interested, I'm always interested to know why people believe what they do. I'm curious about that, and I think you should be too. We'd have a whole lot more opportunities to share our faith with people if we would just care what they think about other things and let them talk. Inevitably, I've found that leads to conversations where I could share what, what I believe. 
So I read Warren Krauss's book, and uh, I, I, I found some things that I thought were interesting and, and perhaps misleading in the book. And it wasn't until I watched a video by William Lane Craig that I was able to see Warren's, Warren's Krauss, this atheist, really smart theoretical physicist, to see his response to some of the Christian objections. William Lane Craig, if you've not heard of him, he's a, a, a gifted Christian philosopher and author and a real blessing to the church. And in a public debate, William Lane Craig said, Lawrence, when you say nothing, that the universe came from nothing, um, you clearly don't mean nothing, but rather you mean something. And in fact, in a public debate, when pushed on the issue, Lawrence Krauss defined nothing as a bubbling, broiling brew of virtual particles, which sounds a whole lot like something. However, his book claims that he could describe how the universe came from nothing. All that he did was describe that it came from something, something that apparently is eternal. That sounds similar to a Christian belief, a belief that there's some eternal source behind the, the world. However, the Christian view is that it's a rational and personal source rather than an irrational and impersonal source. But nonetheless, William Lake Craig said, when you say a universe from nothing, you really mean a universe from a bubbling, broiling brew of virtual particles. The second issue William Lane Craig raised with Lawrence Krauss is he said, you know, Lawrence, you never describe where the intelligible laws that govern the bubbling, broiling brew of virtual particles, where those laws come from, why things operate the way they seem to operate. And in fact, Lawrence Krauss, in a footnote of his book, merely in a footnote, says we have to assume the physical laws of the universe. So he doesn't really tell us where the universe came from. Rather, he is misleading in his title. Um, he believes the universe came from something, and he can't explain where the physical, the intelligible laws of the universe came from. Finally, William Lane Craig said, and here's my last issue with your book, Lawrence. He said, it seems to be an argument against religion disguised as scientific facts. In fact, there's an atheist reviewer who said almost the exact same thing about Lawrence Krauss's book. Because I'm a nerd, and I am, and I enjoy reading, um, and I enjoy paying attention to like at times what seems like superfluous details, I noticed that Lawrence Krauss kept using the word plausible over and over again. Plausible, it's plausible, it's plausible. So in my nerdiness, I counted the number of times that Lawrence Krauss uses the word plausible in his book, A Universe from Nothing. 19 times he implores the reader that this is plausible, it's plausible, it's plausible. And the Apostle Paul says, look, I'm praying that you would be encouraged, that you would be in community, and that you would never get over the gospel because there are people who will try to delude your faith with plausible arguments. I want to close by praying that prayer for you. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and you'd like to talk with someone about that, there are Christian students here who'd love to talk to you and your staff and faculty would love to talk to you. I would love to talk with you. If you're a Christian, my prayer for you would be that you would be in community and that you would be encouraged. And if you're not a Christian, that you would consider the gospel. And so I want to pray that for you now, and then I'll dismiss you. Let's pray. God, you are good, and you are kind, and you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Lord, we pray that we could grow in our walk with you this year. And I pray for students who know you, that this would be a year that they would be encouraged and that their hearts would be knit together in love as they grow in their knowledge and fear of you. Lord, I pray that they would never get over the gospel, that the story of the Bible would grip their hearts and support their lives. And Lord, for students who may not know you, I pray that you would, through your spirit, open their eyes to know the truth. And Lord, I pray if there's a student here today who's discouraged and maybe even feeling like they're all alone, I pray today that they would know that there are people who care about them, that there's hope and help in Jesus and in the followers of Jesus here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.